When it comes to technology, webcams are probably one of my least favorite pieces of it. They're usually a pretty awful things that just don't look good and are a waste of money. Granted, if you're spending $100 on a webcam, I don't think you're expecting it to look like a cinema camera, but there has been sort of a rise of premium webcams, things from three to $500 that are still just webcams. And it's absurd to me because for that kind of price, you could go just a little bit further and get a mirrorless camera because no matter what a webcam manufacturer says, no webcam is actually going to compete with a mirrorless camera. I feel like I'm being way too negative on webcams, but this is sort of a, a personal pet peeve of mine because I feel like I've known so many people who've gotten kind of duped by thinking they're going to get a webcam like this. They're gonna go to Best Buy and spend $100 and get a webcam and then not need a you know mirrorless camera and a nice lens to get good image quality, and it's just not true. Now, if you're just looking for small size and a clear picture, then a webcam could help, but also with the quality of phone cameras improving, built-in cameras being passable, why spend $100 or $200 on a webcam? And if you're gonna spend four or $500 on a webcam, why not just spend a little bit more and get something like the Sony ZV-E10, where you're gonna get infinitely better picture quality and you're gonna have a full-on camera that you can use for other stuff along the way. So despite what it might seem like, I promise I'm not just going to bash webcams for this entire video. I actually wanna talk about the only webcam I've ever liked, which is this tiny adorable thing right here, the Insta360 Link. First of all, it's small, compact, and absolutely adorable, but beyond that, it actually works really well. It doesn't try to be anything that it's not, but it actually brings new functionality to webcams in a very easy to use package. Insta did send me this for free, but I don't have to make a video about it or say anything specific about it. I'm making this video because at the same time they asked if I wanted to try it out, I was literally shopping for this camera on B&H Photo, and I was a little dubious because it's got a manufacturer's retail price of $300, and I was like, this is another $300 webcam that's going to make a lot of promises it's not going to deliver on, I don't know. So now I had the chance to try it out for free, yeah, it just seemed like a much safer bet. But this is literally the only webcam I would ever recommend because it is so good, it is so fun, and I actually use it. Like it's something that I actually use and like. So let's talk about that and explain why. First, I guess a few basics about this. It's small and compact. This is the Logitech C920. This is, I think I got this like five years ago. These are very popular webcams. It's a 1080 webcam. So the form factor is not totally different from something that's been around for a while. Traditional webcams, you plug them in via USB. They usually have a mount that let you attach them to your monitor and a tripod mount. And this connects via USB. It has a mount that lets you attach it to your monitor and it also has a tripod mount on the bottom. It's smaller and more compact. But right here, this is one of the things that really makes this stand out. This is a PTZ webcam, pan, tilt, zoom, and that makes using it easy PTZ. That functionality combined with some really smart built-in software makes this a pretty incredible and genuinely practical camera to use. So first and foremost, the camera itself is really well built. It's pretty heavy. In fact, it's almost so heavy that I'm a little uncomfortable like mounting it to my MacBook Pro display here because it, it's, it's fine, but it just feels a little too heavy. But it does have a tripod mount, so you can mount it on a tripod. And most of the time, I just have it mounted to my monitor over here because that's connected to my Mac Mini. The Mac Mini does not have a built-in microphone or a built-in camera, so now it does because of this. It does not have a permanently connected USB cable, which is great because if something happens or you need to extend the reach of your camera, it's a total pain. It just comes with a standard USB-C to USB-C cable, but it also does include a USB-C to USB-A adapter. So no matter what you're using, you're gonna be able to use this right out of the box. This is a pretty decent length cable, but I like that it's not permanently attached so that if this gets damaged or you just wanna use a longer one or even a shorter one, you can just replace it with the cable of your choice and it works fine. It is plug and play just right out of the box. You don't need to install anything. As soon as you connect it to your computer, you will be able to select it as a webcam source so let's connect it to my MacBook right now. Oy. It does a little calibration dance when it first turns on. This is my 14 inch MacBook Pro's built-in webcam and a microphone. And I actually do think that this microphone is very decent for a built-in one. I use it all the time for personal video calls and stuff. And the webcam, while it is the height of Apple built-in webcam technology at the time I'm making this video, and it is the best one in any Apple laptop I've ever had, 
it's still a little mushy and it's not, you know, it's not crazy sharp, where by comparison, this is the Insta360 Lynx image and built-in microphones. It's really nice that the camera has a decent built-in microphone because I think this is very usable. And the image, of course, is significantly better. So we're gonna stay on this microphone, but we'll jump back to the FaceTime camera. Again, this maxes out at 1080p. And then we'll jump back to the Insta, which instantly looks significantly better. Of course, it's not gonna look the same as something like this, a Sony FX3 with a 24 millimeter f1.4 prime lens. But in terms of just being a clear, crisp image with decent audio, this absolutely gets the job done. I would still wanna use this setup for, you know, professional streams and stuff like that, but I'm more than comfortable using this for, you know, work-related video calls and meetings and consultations and stuff like that. In terms of just clarity and looking good, this absolutely gets the job done. Plus, I need to go over here real quick. What? It's following me? What if I need to, what if I need to go pick up something over here real quick? Look at this, look at this cabinet down here. And then I'll come back over here and reach up to get my microphone. Look at this, this is the Sennheiser MKH-50, my normal microphone. Whew, I'll just come back and sit down at my, my normal desk over here. That is what makes this camera super freaking cool because I taught high school classes online for a year and a half during the pandemic. And while I was really fortunate and grateful to have my camera setup that helped me to create classes that looked and sounded really good, it was also a ton of work. And there were so many days and so many situations where not only would a small camera like this have saved the day, but the ability to have the camera follow me around as I'm trying to teach classes and manage technology and do all this stuff as one person, it really would have made things a lot easier. My, do my dog agrees. Again, if possible, I would always want to use something else or have, you know, I didn't have to lean out of, I forgot, I didn't have to leave out a frame. I can just lean over here and say, hey, look at this. Or, you know, a really nice USB microphone is something that I would kind of prefer to use. But if I'm in a pinch, especially if I'm using something like my M1 Mac Mini over there, then I know I have built-in microphones that can totally get the job done. And everything I'm doing so far is entirely without any software or anything. It's just the camera and the functionality you get as soon as you connect the camera. The motion tracking is not something you have to have all the time. So let's see, I'll turn it off. So you can use this as just a standalone webcam that's not going to follow you around and it's just going to be normal. But if you want it to follow you, all you have to do is hold your hand next to your face and then it's going to flash blue and that's gonna tell you that now tracking is enabled and it's tracking you and it will follow you around. And if you want it to stop doing that, you just give it the peace sign to tell it to go away and then it will stop doing that. If you want to zoom in, you have to hold your hand in the shape of an L, fortunately not on your forehead, but just right here. And then you can move your hand up or down and the camera will zoom in or out. I kept messing this up because I was trying to go forward and backwards, but it's, it's just up or down. And when I'm done using the camera, so let's say I'm using it for a zoom call and then I close out zoom and now there are no applications on my computer that are using the camera. After a few seconds, it's going to automatically tilt the gimbal facing down. So that way, even if somehow the camera accidentally turned on, it's not seeing anything. It's just pointed straight down at the bottom of the gimbal. So that's a really nice little privacy feature they've enabled. There's really no way to do anything similar with the microphones, but you could always just unplug the camera because it's just one simple USB. And then you don't have to worry about that at all. We should definitely talk about the Link controller software because it does open up a lot of possibilities with the Insta360 Link camera. So this is what the software looks like and I'm using the camera right now. The basic page lets you control the gimbal. So even if it's not doing any kind of motion tracking, you can still control the gimbal and position it however you want. You can zoom in or out to different things, yikes. <laughs> um, and you can reset everything if you don't like what you have done. You can also create preset positions. So if there's something you like, you can add that as a preset. That's great if, you know, like when I was teaching online, if I needed to be doing stuff over here and having certain things as a preset, I could have the camera over there, then I could hit another one and it would jump to another position automatically regardless of where I'm at. It also does have a built-in whiteboard mode, which I haven't really tested yet because I'm not somebody who talks in front of a whiteboard very much anymore. But if you are somebody who works with a whiteboard, if you are somebody who walks back and forth a lot like I used to do, instead of having the camera kind of track you or get confused, it will just recognize the whiteboard and then it will just sort of center focus on the whiteboard and not distract anybody with anything else, which is 
a super helpful thing to do. We also do have a lot of manual control over the image of the camera. So we can manually control exposure, white balance, and adjust brightness, contrast, saturation, and sharpness. I've just been using automatic for everything so far and it's worked well. But if you dial things in the way you like them, you can save it as a preset. And then there are more settings over here. You can turn the gesture control on or off. So if you don't wanna deal with that or you don't wanna do that, you don't have to. But honestly, it works really well and it's super fun. The only one I struggle with is the zoom one. It sometimes like, sometimes that one I just have a hard time with, but the start and stop motion tracking, which is really the most important one, that one works really well. Unfortunately, you can't create your own gestures which would be really fun, <laughs> just, I don't know. You want the camera to stop, so you just give it the finger. It'd be really funny on a video call and probably not professional. You can adjust the tracking settings here, fast, normal, or slow. I do have mine set to slow because I thought normal was a little too fast. If I put it on normal, this is kind of what that looks like. It's actually not bad if you're moving fast. And if you're moving fast, then it's gonna be like sport mode, like you cannot outrun this camera but that almost seems a little too artificial. So I have found that slow, even if it means I almost get out of the frame a little bit, it sort of looks the most natural. So I kind of prefer the slow tracking mode. Auto tracking is something I thought I would like, but I'm going to turn that off now because it turns out I don't like it as much. Basically what that means is if the camera's just on and it's not tracking anybody and then you move the gimbal to point it at someone, it's gonna recognize them and start tracking them. I thought that sounded like a good idea, but I've learned since then that sometimes when I'm not using tracking and I just want to position the camera where I want it, I don't want it to then start you know, tracking something. So I'm gonna leave that off. And that means when you're not in a tracking mode, you can just move the gimbal where you want it and it'll point the camera where you want it, which is nice. Single tap tracking. So on the front of the camera, there is an Insta360 logo. That is a button. If you're moving the camera around, like right now, let's turn off the auto tracking. So right now I don't have auto tracking turned on. I can move the camera however I want it. And if I just double tap this, it will recenter everything, which is centered a little bit low. So I could just bump that up a little bit. And there's that right there. I also do have it set single tap tracking. So just in case, you know, I don't know, I don't want someone on a Zoom call to see me just randomly waving at my camera. I could just reach over and tap this logo and now it's going to start tracking me without me having to do the gestures. And I can tap it again to stop tracking me. So I have both of those enabled because it's really cool to use the gestures, makes you feel super futuristic, but also just being able to, you know, discreetly tap that on or off also is a really nice thing that's gonna make you not look like a crazy person doing weird peace sign hand gestures to your camera in the middle of a meeting. There's also an AI zoom setting, which is kind of interesting. So you can have that recognize you and then sort of keep that frame. So right now we'll, we'll say it's my head, for example. And if I stand up and I go over here, it should just kind of keep that medium shot no matter how I move. If I wanted that to be half body, then we can see it sort of changes and reframes. I think so. I'm taller than I am though, I guess. And then there's whole body. I don't know how that one's gonna work. It's in the metaverse, I do have legs, but maybe that's as far as we can go here. And it's, it's a wider shot. It's almost like a wide, medium, and a close-up shot. I have been turning those off just because I get embarrassed sometimes. You can also do autofocus or manual focus, which is cool. And there is a streamer mode, which will let you turn the camera vertically if you want. And it also then puts it into 50 or 60 FPS to help reduce like flicker from screens and stuff, which is actually pretty cool. There is HDR, but you can't do HDR in 4K. You can mirror the image, update the firmware from here if you want. Down here's where you can select your resolution all the way up to 4K, and then you can just turn your preview on or off if you, if you want to, for privacy sake, I guess. And you also have a few other options down here. You can turn tracking on or off in the software. You can turn on the whiteboard mode that I mentioned, but then you have some really cool overhead and desktop modes. So if you are able to position the camera overhead somehow, I guess I can just pick it up and hold it. And we'll pretend that I had it overhead here. Hello. And now we'll turn it to overhead mode. It's going to position itself where now you have an overhead shot to show people whatever it is that you want to show them. And that is pretty cool. This one is pretty darn cool. It does sort of mimic one of the new iPhone features that Apple came out with, and that's a desk view mode. So you can click that, and then it's going to point the camera down and at your desk, but I can then keep something like this book or a document here facing me so I can read it normally. But on the camera, it's also somehow being flipped 
so that way it's right side up for both of us at the same time. As a former teacher who has worked on projectors and spent my fair share of time reading things backwards and sideways and upside down, being able to just read things comfortably while other people are also reading what I'm seeing comfortably is really cool. And to be able to do that without having to reposition the camera is really cool. It is a little strange, like it's a weird field of view and you know, Clearly it's getting kind of wobbly and strange on the edge of the frame there, but it's definitely something that's useful and practical and a really good trick to have, you know, just in your toolkit. The only two things I'm really not crazy about when it comes to this camera are the way that it frames you when it auto tracks. So if I turn on auto tracking, hello, it frames me and it does a decent job, especially if I'm looking somewhere else, it seems like it tries to give you look room, like it doesn't always center you. If you face the camera, it seems like it centers you more. But if you start looking away from the camera, it's almost like it does give you some look space over here, which is really cool. Except I feel like it gives me just too much headroom all the time. I like, you know, having a properly framed shot, which doesn't mean too much headroom. And I feel like whenever this camera moves around, it just leaves a little too much headroom. And as far as I know, there's not currently a way to calibrate that and change like how much headroom or what the default tracking framing is. Maybe that's something that could come in a future firmware update. And then the other thing, which is very minor and definitely a problem I can solve on my own, is that this camera does not come with any sort of case or bag. And it's crazy how much stuff I get that comes with cases and it's like something I would never ever travel with or take anywhere. Why does it come with a case? But in this case, I really wish this did because it is so small and compact. It totally makes sense that if I were going to you know, go somewhere and I think I might have to do a work call along the way. Hey, I'd love to take this little camera with me, but even though it's super well built, it does have a delicate gimbal that I don't want to get smashed and beat up. And it just seems like something that would make a lot of sense to just have a nice little case for, for when you're traveling with it. Those are things I can very much live with to finally have a webcam that's actually decent. It does say that it has an F 1.8 aperture on it. Oh, but that means low light performance. I'm in a bright space. Let's go back in and check out the low light performance. That was the last thing we needed to talk about. So right now I'm in my super bright studio. There are a lot of lights on in here. I will reach over here and grab my little remote and we will turn off my main key light. We can turn off some of the other lights in here. Oh, it followed me. That was... That was a little bit awkward there. This is pretty dark in here and the camera still seems to be holding it together pretty well. I'm gonna turn off this other light. We'll see if it'll follow me all the way here. Is it a 360 gimbal? Oh, hello. Hello. Hey, we're behind the computer now. This is as far as I can go. So not quite 360, but almost. Now it's pretty dark in here. All that's in here are these accent lights, which is not enough. I would not be in here normally when it's this dark. And the camera actually still looks pretty darn good. It's getting grainy. The image definitely is looking grainier than it was before. But honestly, I think it looks better. Let's go back to the FaceTime camera. This one is really trying to compensate for the lack of light by adding in a lot. I have zero wrinkles. I have perfect skin on this camera here. The Insta, I'm a little less than perfect, but maybe that makes me a little more human in this case, finally. So low light performance, pretty decent. Now let me turn all these lights back on. Ultimately, when it comes to this camera, one thing that it isn't is a total replacement for a mirrorless camera setup. But I don't think it's trying to be that. I think it's trying to be a really good webcam that also has some actually useful, smart features built into it. And that's actually why I was interested in this camera in the first place is because Insta is really good at mixing hardware and software in a really effective way where the complexity of the device just gets out of the way. There's definitely a reason why I got my first 360 camera back in 2018 and then didn't do anything with 360 video until 2022 because even though the camera had the capability, the process was a nightmare. And then I got my One X2 at the beginning of 2022 and that led to me really having a lot of fun with 360 video because it takes that super complex, complicated process and makes it super simple, not just through the hardware, but also through the software, through the app on your phone and your computer. I think this is very similar. It's a great piece of hardware, but having a webcam that has gestures and can track you and all this stuff, I feel like that could easily get very, very confusing and overwhelming and ineffective. And they managed to take those features and make them really easy to use, even without the software. If you never download the software and you just use this as a plug and play webcam, 
you still have access to all the tracking and all that. If you decide to use the software, it's incredibly easy to then add more features and functionality into it. And that's what I've wanted out of a webcam is something that's actually practical at being a good webcam and not trying to pretend that it's going to replace a camera that's you know 10 times its cost or more. And it's also very helpful in terms of something to recommend because so many times people want to start streaming or making videos or whatever, and they want the cheapest camera possible, but it just, you're gonna save money, but you're gonna end up paying in frustration over time. And so I always just recommend start with the Sony ZV-E10 because that's gonna be your best streaming camera setup that you can grow with and it's going to look amazing and it's so fully featured. But if you don't need, if you really, really don't need or want the full on camera setup with changeable lenses and everything, then spending $300 on a high quality webcam that has some super cool features is just something that totally makes sense. And speaking of things that totally make sense, thank you to everyone who helped support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. That transition didn't make a lot of sense. Oh, and just now that the video is over, I did a few things weird today that I just kind of wanted to share with you. I'm filming on my FX3 as normal, but I am using an ND filter, which I've never used an ND filter inside before, but that's letting me keep the camera at my base ISO of 800. And I'm just curious if that's gonna lead to any improvement in image quality. The big reason I wanted to try that is because even when I turn the ISO all the way down to 100, I don't shoot in log or anything normally, but even when I turn the ISO all the way down to like 100 or 80, because there are so many lights, this area here on my desk, like these bright, there's a lot of, areas that are overexposed, like even more so than I normally like. I like a bright image, but it's too much. So I'm curious if this looks any better. Hopefully it kind of does. And then the other thing is this camera over here, speaking of log footage, this is the Nikon Z9, which I'm currently just borrowing and just playing around with because I can borrow it and try it out with the Nikon 50 millimeter 1.2 lens, an amazing lens. So this has been at f 1.2 the whole time, which is, it's, very shallow depth of field. And this is recording in N-Log, which I've never used before. So if you've noticed that these cameras didn't match up perfectly throughout the video, that was that. That has nothing to do with the topic of the video. I'm just excited about it. It's always risky to change things. I changed a bunch of things <laughs> in this video. So hopefully it looked okay. And speaking of things that look okay, if you wanna help your videos and your online meetings and calls and streams and stuff look more okay, check out these videos right here.